Senior Advisor to Administrator Lisa Jackson. Um, and I am so excited that you're all here today, the first time we've tried to pull so many Great Lakes leading organizations and leaders together uh, to help us formally open up the week's events. We have some amazing, amazing leaders in their own right who are going to say a few words. Um, I'm going to uh, first, I'm going to introduce everybody right now because I know Administrator Jackson has to leave right after her remarks. Uh, first up will be Administrator Lisa P. Jackson. Many of you know that she's the EPA Administrator, but uh, for those of you who are die-hard Great Lakes fans, you also know that she's also the chair of what's called the Interagency Task Force. And that IATF is a family of 11 department level agencies that all come together, many of you are in the room, uh, who make the best decisions for the Great Lakes you possibly can under President Obama's Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. I will say, uh, before Administrator Jackson joins us, she is indefatigable. Uh, she's been a die-hard advocate she knows the value of water, she knows that we have 20% of the Earth's fresh surface water, and she knows that it's up to all of us to leave them better for the next generation. Next up will be Frank Etowagizic. And uh, many of you know Frank. Frank is a former chair of the Little Traverse Bay Band of Ottawa Indians. Uh, Frank did, ha has done some amazing work in his time. Many of you remember him as being one of our most vocal and articulate advocates uh, in the days of what was called the Great Lakes Regional Collaboration and that strategy that was published in 2005. Today, Frank is the Executive Director of uh, Michigan United, the United Tribes of Michigan. And then finally, we'll have Faye Nelson. Faye today is the President and CEO of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. And for those of you who had the uh, privilege to join Faye last night, amazing water body that is the Detroit River, you know that she is hard at work trying to bring back that riverfront day in and day out with her organization. And so with that, I will start by welcoming Administrator Lisa P. Jackson. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to be here, and uh, it's actually wonderful to be in such a large room. I want to thank Wayne State University and President Gilmore for hosting us, and I want to thank Cam Davis, my extraordinary senior advisor on the Great Lakes, for that lovely introduction. Um, I have to acknowledge uh, the speakers after me because they are people I've heard about for such a long time, whether that's uh, Frank Etowagishik, the past chair of the Little Traverse Band of Odawa Indians and executive director of the United Tribes of Michigan, and Faye Nelson, who I just had a wonderful conversation talking about the extraordinary powers of urban waters to United con uh, uh, Community, president and CEO of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. And to all of you that are part of the Healing Our Waters Coalition, a very special apology and thanks. I'm really sorry I can't be with you this evening. It's probably better for the standpoint of your personal health, because I'm carrying a pretty significant bug. But I do want you to know that the energy of this day, coming together to heal our great lakes, is also very healing for me as well, and I would not have missed it. So thank you so much for the constructive work and hard work you're putting into the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative each and every day. Now, thank you to all of you who are literally taking action together. This week is the first time that so many regional leaders and leading organizations have gotten together in one place at one time to show support for this effort and our shared dedication for getting results for the Great Lakes. <clears throat> that is a dedication shared by me and my colleagues across the federal government and, of course, by President Obama. Having lived and worked and started a family near the shores of Lake Michigan, President Obama has been a longtime advocate for protecting the Great Lakes. 
He knows how important they are to the region and as the home of about 95% of our nation's fresh surface water, how important they are to the entire United States. As, presidency, as president, his advocacy for these waters has actually only grown. He has turned the resources of multiple federal agencies towards setting a new standard of care for these waters. And that's happening in partnership with all of you. It's also no surprise that we are in Detroit today. How about those lions? Wait, <laughs> and tigers. This is a place that has earned its history of success and seen its share of challenges over the year. This city and its many industries rose up around the meeting of Lake Huron and the Detroit River, with Lake Erie just downstream. Decades of building warehouses and factories and parking lots right up to the water's edge meant that people were disconnected from their waterfront. Years of pollution posed serious threats to both the immediate and long-term health of local waters. That is, until visionaries like then City Councilman and Council President Carl Levin, and more recently Faye Nelson, along with many others, decided it was time to bring the waterfront back. Foot by foot, yard by yard, gallon by gallon, the Detroit River and its shoreline has been restored for this community. We are seeing today that urban renewal and community revitalization can literally begin with renewing riverfronts with renewing harbors and lakefronts, as well as the waters that they connect us to. Now that fight to bring back the riverfront here isn't so different from what we are working to accomplish throughout the Great Lakes system. Acre by acre, mile by mile, you are all taking steps to ensure these magnificent water bodies are pulled back from the brink. And that was the thinking when President Obama unveiled his Great Lakes Restoration Initiative a little more than two years ago. We have the vision for what we want our coastal parks and cities and open waters to be. Now it is a matter of dedicating resources and work to turn vision into a reality. Just last year, we joined several of the Great Lakes governors to release our 16 Agency Action Plan. Under that plan, I'm proud to say, and pretty amazing when you consider that last year was really the first full year when we had a season in the field, but we're already showing results. At the Shiawassee Flats, just north of here, fish and wildlife habitat are coming back after decades of losses. That will help improve water quality, reduce flooding, and support this region's proud and rich outdoor heritage. At Chicago's beaches, swimming, bands, and advisories are at a five-year low. And after more than two decades of frustratingly slow progress, we're investing in Great Lakes Restoration Initiative projects in toxic hotspot areas of concern. We're laying the groundwork for places like White Lake and River Raisin right here in Michigan, Sheboygan River and Harbor in Wisconsin, the Ashtabula River in Ohio, all of which will ultimately be taken off the cleanup list. People have spent their entire careers trying to check these communities off the list of places plagued by pollution. It's not a list anyone wants to be on. We're taking steps and getting results. Again, thanks to you. Now this, of course, is just the beginning. We have a long way to go to help guide the work. I'm proud to announce today on behalf of the Federal Interagency Task Force for the Great Lakes our key priorities for 2012 and 2013. While continuing to plan for rapid responses, we must step up our efforts to prevent invasive species from entering the Great Lakes. We know that prevention is far more cost effective than dealing with the damage that has already been done. I think I should have said you know. With record setting harmful algae levels occurring in parts of the Great Lakes, we are focusing resources on reducing phosphorus. Reducing phosphorus to the watersheds of Ohio's Maumee River, Michigan's Saginaw River, and Wisconsin's Lower Fox River. And we are making it a priority to finish the job in 2013 through 2014 at Deer Lake, 
Manistique River, St. Clair River, St. Mary's River, and the Waukegan Harbor areas of concern. We want to check them off the list too. On that last point of cleaning up areas of concern, we are asking for greater assistance from all of you here today. The Restoration Initiative can offer up to 65% federal funding to clean up remaining toxic hotspots, but the balance must come from somewhere. This week, in conjunction with the Great Lakes Commission, we're releasing a brochure to show how the rest of the financing can work. You don't have to be a public finance expert to take a copy and begin promoting this important program because it's key to more progress in our areas of concern. And I want to say a special thanks to Jim Tierney from New York State DEC, who chairs the Great Lakes Commission and has been so helpful in that work. Coming together to address those areas of concern is a perfect example of the spirit and letter of taking action together. And I look forward to working on all of those priorities with you. Now, since the beginning of the administration, President Obama has made restoring our nation's water, waters a top priority. It's an issue that's kept a lot of us busy for the last two years on everything from Recovery Act investments to the historic restoration efforts on treasured water bodies to the work we are doing through this Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. There's other efforts, though, that are very important, like the America's Great Outdoors Partnership and the Urban Waters Federal Partnership, which are supporting important steps to keep America's waterways clean and safe. Even some of our air programs are essential to the work. I'm sure many of you saw the recent report from the Great Lakes Commission that looked closely at mercury in the lakes. After taking more than 45,000 samples from fish, birds, and other wildlife in 35 separate studies, they found that not only is mercury more widespread than they thought, but also that levels have been rising in some species. EPA has proposed the first ever mercury and air toxic standards for power plants which will help significantly reduce the amount of mercury that is released into our air and makes its ways into our country's waters. EPA is committed to finalizing those standards because it will clean up the air we breathe. It will benefit the health of our children and because it will help reduce the mercury in our environment that pollutes our beloved Great Lakes. These waters are working harder than ever before. Some 42 million Americans and Canadians depend on the Great Lakes for drinking water. And the waters support at least, I think this number is low, one and a half million jobs and $62 billion in wages annually. For the Great Lakes to continue to take care of us, we need to take care of them. Thank you so much for allowing me to address you, but more importantly for coming together this week under the banner of taking action together to do just that. Thanks. Good afternoon. I'm going to introduce myself in our, in our language. I would say, Pipigwa hodo dem, nakwe gishi kondishnikaz, waganuxing and donjaba. I said the sparrowhawk is the mark of my family or my totem. Noonday is my name, and I come from that, that land of the, that place of the crooked tree, which is in northern lower Michigan. I'm known as Frank Etowagishik on my driver's license, and I also carry these traditional names. Indian people, native people, indigenous people, we carry those, those uh, we carry our past with us as well as, as we work towards the future. I want to acknowledge all of the elders and the teachers that have, uh, that have been helpful in my life, that have helped teach me, and that uh, without whom I wouldn't be here.
today to be able to be speaking to you. There's, uh, I came from ceremonies that we've had just this uh, past weekend. And while there, there was a song that was sung. And I want to sing that for you, and then I'm going to talk about it briefly. That song says, Water, we love you, we thank you, we respect you. And that is a song that's being sung often in many of our lodges and ceremonies these days as we deal with our sacred responsibilities. For Native people, caring for the waters is not merely a matter of practicality. It's a matter of, of that dealing with that sacred responsibility that we have in our everyday in our everyday life. The tribal governments and individual tribal citizens, all of us are working in different ways to protect the waters that we have and to meet those responsibilities. There are perils of things of the modern world, one of which is this is a concept of commodification of the water. Because the water is a commonly held, natural, essential resource. And we need to think of it in that way. It's not something that is owned by individuals, but something that is cared for, because it's essential to all of us. Each one of us here started our lives in our mother's womb in that water. And that water is in our blood, it's in our bodies, it's you know, it's throughout, it's in the tears, it's in the rain, it flows through the veins of Mother Earth. Caring for the water in our culture is a woman's role. But in addition to that role that they have as they take that on, the men, our responsibility is to assist them with that. And so I, I do everything that I can and have done as a leader and as an individual to try to help train myself to do the best I can at helping to protect and preserve the water. What we know of is that we can live without oil. Be a little inconvenient, it's been hard to get the gas in my car to get me down here today, you know, but, but nevertheless, we, we lived as human beings on this earth for, for thousands and thousands of years without relying on oil. It's only recently that we've, oil has become so important. We can live without gold. Now, there's, that's also a bit inconvenient here and there, but, that's, but gold is an essential to our lives. But we cannot live without water which makes water a completely different thing for us to think about. We're taught in the Native community to think, to think through the consequences of our actions through a time period long enough to encompass seven generations. And I like to think of that, it's not something you count out seven and you know, as a thing, but each 
generation is another generation down the road. It's like going down the road at night with your driving the car and your headlights are shining ahead of you and every hundred yards further you go down the road, your lights go further. Well, it's that same thing. It's a buffer. It's a, it's a time in front of us that we're to think through. What are the consequences of our actions? Not just a five-year plan or a 10-year plan, but a seven-generation plan. Well, not only do we think about that, you know, when we look at that, but each one of us in this room is also someone's seventh generation. What is it that brought us to this room? And to all those that are listening through the internet, what's bringing you to be here, to be, in, to be listening to this, to this conference? Those things that our ancestors did that helped bring us, get us in the right mindset, the right education, where we live geographically, all of those things came together to get us in this room. Well, what we also look at that, what are we going to leave for those people, those seven generations to come? When they're considering this, what is it that they're going to have? We have choices to make. We can make choices that enhance and help and encourage and, and make the world a better place. We can do nothing or we can actually take decisions that will make it a little less, that will cause harm. We're taught that we need to walk softly on Mother Earth to leave, leave very light footprints, do the best we can. Seven generations from now, my hopes are that we have healthy waters, a healthy environment, prosperous communities, safe, happy, healthy children. It's a fairly simple goal, and yet it is extremely difficult to, to get there. Hopefully through this conference that we have and others like it, and in, in all the work that we individually, each one of us do in our lives, we can make that, we can make that, that vision come to pass. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you so very much for that warm welcome and good afternoon. It is my absolute pleasure to be with you today to share the story of Detroit's transformation of our riverfront. Now I hope that many of you are here today, you're enjoying yourself, uh, our tigers and our lions. Um, yeah, that's great. <laughs> I'm a native Detroiter, so I have to tell you, I have such a passion for my sports team here. But I hope that you've also had an opportunity to experience our beautiful riverfront. And if you haven't, I encourage you to do so before you leave. You will be so amazed at how beautiful it is. We have such pride as a community. And even though we've just begun, it is an absolutely fantastic place and space. So I hope you'll find uh, some time to visit our waterfront. You know, it's no secret that these days a uh, revitalized waterfront can be a significant catalyst in the economic and the social revival of a community. Think about Baltimore or Pittsburgh or Chicago. Many of these communities have really got it in the sense that they have very skillfully taken their waterfront and connected it with the revitalization and the sustainability of their respective communities. And the good news, we are so thrilled that finally here in Detroit, we've got it and we are working so very hard to bring our riverfront back to life. The Detroit River has a very rich history dating back to the founding of Detroit to the time of the traders. We've had fabulous ribbon farms, all of which contributed very significantly over hundreds of years to uh, the development of Detroit. But despite all of these years of growth and support 
by our Detroit River, there really was never a focus on a pedestrian connection, if you will, to the waterfront. And so when the economy had its downturn, um, you really, from a symbol, symbolic perspective, saw this no clearer than our riverfront when you um, focused on the disrepair, the abandoned buildings, the silos, the warehouses, all really almost an, an image, if you will, or a symbol of the decline of our city of Detroit. And even though we, we knew somehow that coming together to bring our waterfront back to life would be very significant as far as our overall community was concerned, we just couldn't get there in the 70s, and in the 80s and even in the 90s, we, for a variety of reasons, just could not come together to develop a plan. But in 2002, the stars aligned and the right visionaries came together, all embracing a brand new city administration. A key element of this plan included the creation of a nonprofit organization to really serve to lead the redevelopment of the Detroit Riverfront, and that was and is continues today to be the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, the organization that I head. We were formed in 2003 with a two-pronged mission. First and foremost, to develop public access on the Detroit River. All the way up until now, our community has had no access to our waterfront, believe it or not. But as importantly, in addition to that public access mission, we were charged with the responsibility of serving as an anchor for economic development. And we were founded by really three key partners as, these, as the key community and civic and public came together to begin focusing on this issue of, of developing a plan, identifying an organization, bringing this waterfront back to life. These three key entities began with the city of Detroit, which provided land and a significant amount of infrastructure support for the public development as well as the mixed-use development with a very focused strategy early on in this process of directing funds to remove the cement silos that were all that littered our riverfront, opening the way actually for the development of our public space. General Motors, which put an additional $25 million, now this was in the early 2000s, so they added an additional $25 million to their half a billion dollar restoration of their headquarters, the Renaissance Center, which is right on the waterfront, in order to develop their waterfront presentation, which included a plaza as well as the first brand new half mile of Riverwalk that they immediately donated to the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. And then last but certainly not least, the Kresge Foundation, which provided the economic catalyst for our project, making its largest grant ever still today to a single project, which was $50 million. So with those three key entities, we were launched. And in large part, it is because of this public-private partnership that we have been extraordinarily successful over these past eight years. Our overall vision is to develop five and a half miles of waterfront. We look to go as far west as the Ambassador Bridge, which is our bridge to Canada, to far east as Gabriel Richard Park, which is just east of our Belle Isle Bridge. Now what we've done is we've divided the vi this vision into two phases, with the first phase being our East Riverfront vision, which is three and a half miles of waterfront from our Joe Louis Arena, which is where our Red Wings play, to uh, just east of our Belle Isle Bridge. And today, today we can boast more than 80% of the first phase of our vision complete. Now what that means is we've got three miles of waterfront that is open, that our community is connecting to, that they are totally enjoying. And this three miles includes a absolutely vibrant river walk that connects plazas and pavilions and parks and butterfly gardens and fountains and bike shops and cafes. It is absolutely stunning to us just how much we've been able to accomplish, we, that public-private partnership, since the inception of this organization. This first phase, this three and a half, three miles rather, of the three and a half mile um, goal was completed in 2007, and since that time, millions of individuals have come down to enjoy our waterfront. 
What I'd like to show you is the next couple of slides to give you a sense of the magnitude of this transformation. And these photos are not from 30 years ago or 20 years ago. This was actually the way our waterfront looked in 2003. So you can see our before and after. Here's some more before and after pictures. In the waterfront, we've also, we've just got so many fabulous amenities as well from our bike shops to we actually have riverboat tours, our cafe, we have a, 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 a fabulous uh, carousel. It's just, it's just amazing what coming together as a community we've been able to do. It was a $300 million initiative that has already contributed significantly to an improved quality of life for our community. And that's today, it being the development of this waterfront will play a very key role in the revitalization of Detroit. Now back to the waterfront, we are, there's just so much activity that takes place on the riverfront. We host not only our annual River Days Festival, which brings hundreds of thousands of folks down to the waterfront. We have all kinds of environmental, educational, as well as recreational programs. We have fabulous programs to keep you healthy. We've got yoga on the river. We have Tai Chi on the river. We have an Autobahn club. I mean, you name it. It's just been so amazing how we are so fastly as a community learning all of the value and the benefits of this fabulous body of water. This new quality of life that can now be found at our riverfront, we're now focusing on how we can connect it with economic development. This investment can be seen in a variety of ways. Most recently, a number of corporations have announced their intent to move to downtown Detroit. As a matter of fact, they're already moving to downtown Detroit. 3,000 employees from our Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, thousands of employees from CompuWare and Quicken, all coming down to downtown Detroit, the riverfront playing a key role in terms of attracting, as far as attracting these businesses down to, to our downtown area. But it's not just the workforce, but it's also it being downtown. The riverfront is becoming a magnet for people who want to live in downtown Detroit. According to the recent census, downtown Detroit has experienced a 59% increase in the number of college-educated residents under the age of 35 years old this past decade. So we're moving, and things are beginning to come back to life here in Detroit, certainly on our waterfront. But it's not just employees moving down to the river. Before the economic tsunami, if you will, that our uh, community, certainly this nation, experienced, there were a number of residential developments that were announced on the waterfront. But those have been stalled. And they are slowly, we're beginning to see interest um, expressed again as far as developing mixed use on the riverfront. But we haven't stopped, and, and our public-private partners have continued to work to develop even in these challenging economic times. Here's an example of some of the development that's already uh, on our waterfront, beginning with the William G. Milligan State Park and Harbor. It's Michigan's first urban state park right on our riverfront. It offers trails and shoreline fishing. We've got interpretive signage, wildlife observation. We have a wetland uh, designed for stormwater treatment. In addition, we have a harbor that features more than 50 boat slips, covered picnic areas, um, just all kinds of cool stuff in addition to a 63-foot replica of a historic northern Michigan lighthouse right on our Detroit riverfront. In 2009, and here's another before-after picture, the Conservancy as well as our partners opened the Dick Wondercut Greenway, which was um, an old and abandoned rail line that now has been restored into this fantastic greenway which essentially connects the river to our iconic farmers market, Easter market, as well as the surrounding community. Really encouraging more connection, more walkability, and that's just the first of a number of greenway initiatives that are currently underway thanks to the Community Foundation of Southeast Michigan. This summer, we were so pleased to welcome to the riverfront the new Detroit Wayne County Port Authority Terminal and Dock. It opened on the riverfront with a uh, fabulous fanfare. We anticipated that it will attract and strengthen economic as well as tourism opportunities for our city and our region. The terminal not only houses the authority's headquarters, but also a passenger terminal and a customs processing center. 
The new dock, which is a big deal for us, it can accommodate now all types of water vessels, from cruise ships to ferries. Uh, there are even discussions with our friends across the water in Windsor as far as ways in which to connect by way of water taxi services. So we've only just begun, and we're just so pleased to be able to have um, the Wayne County Port open and, and part of our whole riverfront synergy and the excitement. There are other recent developments, a new university, Math and Science High School, that serves more than 2,000 students right in the Riverfront District. The brand new Roberts Riverwalk Hotel, which some of you I think are staying at. And we're just so pleased to have Michael Roberts bring his hotel to our waterfront. And then the Cobo Hall, our convention center, is currently under a renovation. And once it's completed, its whole southern exposure will be glassed and, and, and facing uh, a beautiful view of the Detroit River. And it will actually connect it being the Cobo Center to the Riverwalk. So it's so much activity, and that's just an example. Of, of some of the development that's currently in play. And then we're, we're coming back as far as additional development of our own is concerned. In the spring of next year, we will begin the development of the final phases of the East Riverfront. So once we've completed our development efforts, we'll have three and a half miles of beautiful, landscaped, developed public space waterfront. And our development will include, first and foremost, we'll be focusing on the Uniroyal site, which has been contaminated for decades. And finally, the remediation is underway and we're so excited and pleased because it represents the largest disconnect as far as this riverfront pathway uh, development on the East Riverfront end. In addition to um, the Uniroyal site, Mount Elliott Park, we're going to redo a, a park um, which is located immediately west of the Uniroyal site which will have shoreline improvements. We're going to build another pavilion and plaza to lead specification, as well as a fully accessible play area with water fountains and all that good stuff for children of all abilities to enjoy. We'll also construct other smaller sections, again, the purpose of which is to open up the river to create more of a destination place and space for the community to enjoy. It's fabulous, it's wonderful. I know there's one last area I really have to obviously talk about is funding. How are we financing all of this? Well, as I mentioned earlier, this was a $300 million initiative that was launched, uh, of which the conservancy's nut, if you will, is 140 million. That 140 million will give us all of the funds to construct as well as to permanently operate, maintain, provide the security and programming for the East Riverfront, the first phase of our project space. And if that wasn't enough, we are responsible for raising all of the funds. We receive no tax subsidy. Uh, the Conservancy is responsible for funding all components of this project. And quite frankly, I have to tell you that my board won't let me build what I can't take care of. So. With that in mind, um, of the $140 million, we've raised $105 million to date. We are uh, prepared to launch the next phase of our capital campaign next month, in which we'll be announcing uh, a new gift to launch that effort. And we will continue to stay focused on raising all of those dollars, constructing the remaining portions of the East Riverfront, and beginning to expand our vision to the West as we begin to move forward um, to fulfill fill our five and a half mile bridge to bridge and beyond vision. So on that note, I'm going to conclude my remarks by welcoming you again to Detroit, thanking you so much for your support and inviting you to come down and check out our waterfront. Thank you so very much.